We've also got our beautiful Shana that is a child of this congregation. She's sitting in a Ukraine, uh, a Ukraine on the southwest side. And they recently, I would say, I don't want to say safe, but because the, the Lord is uh, sheltering her, but let's keep them in prayer. And so for salvation for many during this time, as it's day four of the war. Sorry, mm -hmm. We're also keeping the parents of Shana. Amen. Because yes. you can only imagine what a father goes to the mother, knowing their daughter or their child is on that side. Yeah. Keep them in prayer. Amen. So um, then we just want to ask, uh, uh, we're going through the series of seven churches of Revelations. This week it will be Sardis. You can join us via online or Facebook Live, or you can come to the office if you want to be here and um, adhere to social services. I'm not going to go through all the weekly activities. You can get it on our calendar of what's happening. But one special request today is um, if you would please support, you're going to see the dance, uh, the light of Jesus dance ministry today doing an item. But please, won't you support them after the service? Ice cream or suckers. Ice suckers on a beautiful day like this. Donations of 20 rand. So if you can please come, they set up on the front. Then we just like to ask a uh, community church in Atlantis has requested Bibles, second hand Bibles. We've gone to the Bible Society, they cannot assist us at this point. So if you've got second hand Bibles at home, an extra one that you haven't looked at, please bring it. There are people that need it English and Corsa. So that is for a Bible project we're doing for Atlantis. And I thank you for your support there. Then we would just like to um, make a mental note, Brother Brian won't be here, but maybe he'll watch from the UK online. Um, Sunday the 13th, we are um, going to have Batya Shuli. She is an Ethiopian Jewish lady that has got incredible testimony to come and share with us. You'll meet Batya and her husband on Sunday morning the 13th of March. And she'll share a story then. For the men, please stay tuned. There's a men's ministry coming up. I'm giving you ample um, notification 26th of March, and we'll give more details as the month goes on. If you miss out on anything, there's sermon notes, there are birthdays, many things happening. Please go to our Facebook page and you'll get all the info there. Have a blessed service. We're going to worship the Lord. And while we're praying, while we're worshiping, we want you just to be sensitive, think about the Ukraine, think about Shannon, think about the people we've lost, so that we are praying and keeping them in prayer in the sign of prayer. So let's stand and let's just experience what God is going to do this morning.
Jesus. Lord, let our hands be in the snow.
just say, here we are. Let me just stop and say, Lord, here I am.
just where you stand and just pray this morning. Just surrender everything to you this morning. I surrender. I surrender everything to you this morning. I surrender to you this morning. We pray this morning. If you know surrender, often you've watched movies and you've seen the soldiers that surrender they come out of the white flag. And their hands are raised up high. And that's how we surrender to the Lord this morning. Jesus holds the white flag and says, Come in peace to me this morning. And we come and say, Lord, here I come with my hands stretched up to heaven this morning. And I'm going to give everything to you this morning. For you are my everything. You are my all in all. And I don't want to give anything, but everything that I have, all that I am, all that I have, I want to offer to you to the Lord here I am this morning. All my pains and my hurts, all my concerns, my anxieties and my worries, I want to come to you this morning. I want the ladies to stop this morning.
as a family, Lord, we are reminded that from Genesis to Revelation, the book is about your love, an ending love for us. Your desire to have an intimate relationship with us. And in this relationship, you meet all our needs. You supply our needs according to the glory that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father God, as we are about to give offerings, we are challenged to find anything that is worthy of your life that we can give. We know you instituted the practice of giving, not because you need anything from us, but because you want us to have an intimate relationship. Giving is a reminder of where we came from, where what we have comes from. So Father God, this morning we just want to say, we give you our hearts. We give you our hearts. That's all we can give you that is, is even worth talking about. We give you our time. We are all here. And for those who are watching from home, they are giving you their time. Lord God Almighty, your kingdom needs activities to be reformed. So we give you the financial resources so that, Lord, those who do the work, they can do the work. So for these those gifts that we shall give you, we thank you for everything, for we know all these things come from you anyway. We thank you for the obedience in our hearts to give what we can give. And you say it, you love those who give cheerfully. Thank you, Father. We pray that every cent that shall be given this morning will go towards the things that matter to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just to see as you take the offering. As a leadership, we will be short sighted. If we didn't realize that there are many, that are experiencing financial problems. We have got a call from a big company. And we ran us going into the city now and COVID has had such an impact on people's finances. But we want to encourage you to keep your eyes on Jesus. Petrol prices are going up, food prices. But he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And he says that he will provide according to our every need for his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. I
as we forgive those that have sinned against us. So here is, what about Anne? I knew you were going to bring up Anne. <laughs> no, no. She's told stories about me. She lied about me. She still owes me money. No, no. But your prayer is, what about your prayer? Oh, well, I didn't mean those words. <laughs> well, at least you're being honest. But it's quite a load to carry around all that bitterness and resentment, isn't it? All right, yes, but once I get even with her, once I get revenge, she will never mess with me again. No, Eris, you won't feel any better. In fact, you'll feel worse. Revenge isn't as sweet as everybody thinks. You know how unhappy you are. Well, I can change that. You can? How? Forgive me. Then I can forgive you. And then all that hate and sin that you're carrying in your heart will now become Anne's problem, not yours. You will have settled the problem as far as you're concerned. No, she cannot get away with this. I can't forgive Anne. Then I can't forgive you. All right. Actually, more than watching the bench on Anne, I want to be right with you, Lord. Yeah. Okay, Lord, I, I forgive her. I forgive her. There yeah. now. That's wonderful. How do you feel now? Okay, Lord. I'm getting better. I might even have a good night's sleep tonight. Good. But you're not quite finished with your prayer. Go on. Okay. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Good. I'll do just that. But just don't put yourself in places where you may be tempted.
Matthew chapter 6, please. preparing this word while I was on leave. And then Brian came to me and Brian asked about doing this skit. And I said, it fits perfectly in. But Brian said, well, I said, yes, Brian. Then I said, but he needs to do it. He's leaving. This is his last Sunday. We're going to pray for Brian. He's going back to the UK. So I said, well, let's do it on. He said, what about the 27th? I said, well, then I'm preaching that Sunday. He said, well, everything fits into place. We are coming out of the month of February where we've been dealing with the theme of cleansing. And often we don't realize the things that are in our heart. Like there is said, the unforgiveness towards people. And you can't answer, you can't understand that why is God not answering my prayer? Because He cannot answer prayer if your sin stands before. I want you to turn with me to Matthew 6, verse 5 to 13 this morning from the trial of this year. In Luke 6, we see a similar passage in Luke's Gospel. But it says here in Matthew 6, and this is so important because Matthew 5 to 7 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is where he lays the foundation for his ministry. There are many people that are followed him. And this is where he lays the foundation, and out of this, he gives the moral prayer. And he says, and when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. So they should I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. Now your room is your secret place, which might be your office, it might be your car, Everyone has got that one place, you know, we rush in the morning with children. You have that one place where you can become quiet. Has, has anyone got a place like that? Because your house is never a quiet place in the morning, is it? Sometimes it's more like a bad zone. But you find that place where you become, and that becomes your prayer time with God. It says, Pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. And remember when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, and the false prophets of Baal were shouting and screaming and cutting themselves and repeating themselves? Did that answer God's prayer? No. The only thing with Elijah, at the right time he stepped forward, and he prayed a very simple prayer in God wants. It says there, therefore do not be like that your father knows the things that you have that you have need of before you ask for them. He said, in this manner, therefore pray. And I want you to pray this with me at the moment. It's on and behind me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you this morning that once again, you renew our prayer life. And prayer never has to be something that becomes a burden. Something that we've got to, like a car, cold car starting up. But it's something that must, we must look forward to. Something that must be natural. As we build a relationship. Pray now, Lord, that I become less as you become greater. This word you've given me already, right in the beginning of the year, for this church. I pray, Lord, that the words of my 
love and meditations of my heart will be pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name. All of God's children say, Amen. Amen. It starts off with a father and a child relationship. Now, a father's love is so important to a child. Child's development and the lack of it is adversely affects the child, his behavior and outlook on life. And that's why so many children, or so many adults today, are afraid to come to God and pray because they never had that relationship with the Father. God is our Father. Amen? He's the example of what a Father's love is all about. He made gifts. He gave Jesus. He loves us. His love is sacrificial, it's patient, it's kind, it's humble, it's honest, it's forgiving, it's faithful, and it's selfless. It's never about him, it's about you, when he thinks of you. And his love remains constant. Now who can put their hand up and say, you had a father like that, that you could go to and speak to? And I guarantee it's not many, but if you are, put your hand up this morning knowing that you had such a relationship that you can talk to your father. See Psalm 103, 13 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. That word also can be, As a father loves his children, so the Lord loves those who fear him. And a father who shows affection and is supportive on their children, it has a great impact and effect on the child's cognitive and social behavior. It gives them a sense of well-being, a sense of self-confidence, identity, and often children don't have that. And so later in the month we're having our men's ministry, and it's really about getting men to stand up and understand the role you play in your child's life. We're living in a generation which is fatherless. Here and there there are fathers, but there's also absent fathers. They're there, but yet they're not there. But a father that shows us affection and you experience it helps you to approach God our Father knowing firstly that He wants to be involved in your life. He loves you and then you can approach His throne of grace with confidence in prayer. Not fearful. And so we heard this morning and I'm going to try to just look over a few things. Our Father in heaven in the Middle East, the Father was the highest authority. When Jesus' disciples asked Say, please teach us to pray. The first thing he started off, he pointed to a place of authority and said, Our Father. The highest authority is the Father in the Middle East. And so the Father made decisions in the interest of the family. And when he didn't agree with you, it wasn't because he wasn't agreeing, he was, he was thinking about what is the best decision that affects this family going forward. And every decision that came to him and every Matter that he looked at would receive his approval and his blessing. Psalm 100 verse says, Know that the Lord is God. It is you who made us and we are not ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We belong to him. He wants the best. He has your interest at heart. But Proverbs 3 says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. There are many that, that claim and profess their relationship but I look at the relationship in, with the Lord should also reflect a relationship with your church. Do you agree with me? Amen. If I can submit to the Lord, I submit to the church where I am. This is my place. This is where I belong. This is going into my 23rd year. I haven't packed my bags and run yet. And hopefully I will not do that. This is where I live at my ministry, my calling. This is where I give my pride in my finances. To this church. Because I, I stand under the authority of God. And so I understand our Father, He is the one that I submit to. And in Luke's Gospel chapter 15, the younger son approached his father and he didn't accept the authority. And he was not willing to submit. When you start looking at the parables, you start seeing the real uh, stories, the truth of the parables coming out that Jesus was teaching. A son that wouldn't stand under the, the authority of his father, wouldn't respect his father. He actually, in fact, said, I wish you were dead so I can get what is mine. We heard that it was said now that the word, hallowed be your name, is to honor. 
Well, in the Middle East, and still today, honor is a very important thing. If you go into the Muslim religion today, honor, children, daughters especially, they still kill if they do not respect the wishes of the parents. We see it happening even in India. We see it happening in Iran. It's all about the honor of the name of the family. Hallowed be your name. Today people use the name of God as a curse word. They use it to blaspheme. But when we say that we confess in, the, in this name that we use, we have healing. By using God's name, we know this is the almost powerful name that brings life, healing, deliverance. The name in which our prayers are answered. There's no other name. Today we know Him by Jesus, Yeshua. It says, if you ask the Father anything in my name, He will give it to you. How many movies have you watched recently that have had the name of Jesus as a swear word or a curse, but you've continued to watch the movie? If, it, if you become desensitized to that name, pray that the Holy Spirit will make you more sensitive, that when they do it again, it will stab you in the heart and you'll put that movie off. Can I get an amen on that? You see, to hallow and to honor God's name, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 30, he said, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. Every decision, everything you do to honor, you do it to glorify the name of God. Your kingdom comes, speaks of your responsibility to God. Not your responsibility to your own ministry on the side. Your kingdom comes means, Lord, I'm building your kingdom. I'm not building my kingdom outside this church. Brad and Lisa Eston's ministries where we shine. It's not about that. It's about church on the rise. The ministries that take place in this church. So many pastors and people that are building their separate ministries because it's their kingdom. They're building their own little kingdom where they can be exalted. That's not what God's asking. It's always about His kingdom. And family responsibility is that daughters are married off, but sons take on the responsibility to extend the family business. And with that family business, they look after the welfare of their parents. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place. My father's house so many mansions. If we're not so good at all, go to prepare a place. In such a way that he went to prepare a place. So we are bringing people in through the great commission into the kingdom because he's expecting to build many rooms. That's why it's 2,000 years later. Can we give the Lord a praise offering? <laughs> we all think we've got a ministry, but what is the ultimate ministry? Go out and make disciples. That's ultimate. All the others are on the periphery, they're on the boundaries. Yes, they're nice, but it's not the main one, the primary one is to make disciples preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's when you, when you say your kingdom come, you say, Lord, I accept your call upon my life to go out and make disciples. Your kingdom, your will be done. And while I'm living on this earth, your will be done speaks of a righteous living. Because when you speak of righteousness, righteousness speaks, speaks about being in right standing with God. Righteousness speaks about doing what God wants you to do. Not what I think He wants me to do. Well, I think God's called me to start a nice business in Hawaii. Amen. Lord, please don't call me for Hawaii or the Bahamas. I pray so hard, Lord, don't send me back into Africa. <laughs> Your will be done. In Haggai 1, 5 to 9, when we consider this for a moment, the people that returned back from exile, the calling was to build the temple. 
they had received the, any, the decree from the king to go back and to build the temple. They were not to go back and build their houses because that was part of it. Yes, we need to build our house here. But some people have got better houses they're staying in today than what the house of the Lord looks like. We want to paint. We want to do things. Where's your heart for God's kingdom? Your will be done, he says. He says, consider your ways. Go to the mountains. Bring wood to build the temple that I may take pleasure and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but it came to little. When you brought it home, he says, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord? Because my house lies in ruins. Our first primary concern is always the temple of the Lord. And the temple of the Lord is not literally this church. The temple of the Lord is people coming into the kingdom of God. Building the temple of God. But we become sidetracked. My wife always says, if she can, she would like a little garage in Nangamal. That's what she wants. And I said to her, that little garage that you're going to stay in and you want is going to distract you from God's will. But I love Nangamal. We all love certain places, but God hasn't called me to number one. So she has to accept what I say because I know where God's called me. And this is where God's called me. And if I allow her to influence me, my concern will be more in Lamabon than in church on the rise. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? We can be distracted by things because we've taken our eyes off the work of God. And that's why it says, your will be done. Matthew 6, 32 to 33 says, But after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all things. He says, but they seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things will be added. And so they came back from captivity, and they were concerned with their own house, their own comfort, their own security, their own fuels, their own stock. And that's how we all become. But he says, but if you focus on the righteousness of God in doing and seeking it, he says, I'll supply all those other things. It's not that he doesn't want you to. He wants you to keep your eyes on him and not on the things of this world that's passing away because he'll give you and give you more if you do so. And if you're doing this operational war like Elijah, Elijah was a prophet. Elijah wasn't called to be a psalmist or a musician or a dancer. He was called to be a prophet of God. The operation of God is doing what God calls you to do. Oh, but I like because Peter and, and Karina, they on the worship. I want to be worship. Sometimes I wish the, the people that have auditioned in the past for the worship team, I want to say, I wonder if they know what they sound like. They're not musicians. They're not singers. God has given specific people certain gifts. Stay in your gifts and your calling. That's what we all to do. We are not all good with our hands, craftsmen. We are not all doctors, we're not all dentists. We're not all gift. Everyone's got a gift. Use that specific gift to serve God. And if you do it, do it to the glory of His name. His geographical will is due in the right place. As I said earlier, God hasn't called me to Hawaii. And you hear Him? Oh, but I've been praying. I, I remember in the early years, just said to myself, I'm talking almost 30 years ago, the people were saying, and God said, I must do this God. And He said, Lord, what's wrong with you? Don't hear your voice. You're telling all these people there's something wrong with me. Maybe I had tears, the radio, the signal was wrong. And then they would just resign and be talking. We were in our 20s, I think it was 24, 25. And Jessica was just maybe a couple of years older. But um, they had more hair, black hair. And then the next week, the person would come and say, No, the Lord is told me to go back to my job. And I just scratch my head thing. The Lord's not a God of confusion. Geographical world is to be in the right place, doing the right thing, what he calls you to do. And if you're doing that and in the right place, that's the place of provision and protection. Stepping out of that, you open yourself up to danger. You could be killed before your time because you're not in the place he wants you. Or you could die of hunger because there's no provision. Then you blame God because I've been called you there. The motivation of the God is why are you doing what you're doing? 
And if you're doing it for the right heart and, you, and you're doing it for the right reason, He will reward you for that. Give us this day our daily bread. And as you're doing God's will, you ask Him, give us today our daily bread. You're trusting Him. You're trusting Him for His provision. You're not trusting for tomorrow. And we're living in a world, a Western world, on humanist secularism that's taken God out of the equation and taken Sunlam and on mutual and all these companies and replaced them with God. And then we start saying, no, but you know, Sunlam says, your life is in my hands. Well, I've got news. My life is in God's hands. My life is not in my pension fund. My life is not in a retirement community. Yes, I would want that money, but God is my source. He's my provider. Can we give the Lord a praise offering? No, but you're not being right. You're not thinking properly because the economist said that the economist is the economist God. Who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? But my bank balance shows that. Well, God can take that few bread and He can multiply it and He can make a bakery out of it. I'm taking us back to the basics today. Because we've taken our eyes off the Lord. And we've looked at secular humanism, we've looked at reason and logic, and we try to put God in that in the Bible. That's not the God. The God that I serve is the God that provided for 40 years in the wilderness. The God that provided manna, the God that provided meat, and they never, and they complained and yet He was providing. The Bible says, do not worry what you will eat, what we shall drink, what we shall wear. He did not say that, He says, but if we do his work and seek his righteousness, he will add and give to us. My late mother-in-law told me that when she was staying in Italy, that was before Lisa was born with her, with her brother and sister, she couldn't understand it just to get, she couldn't handle it. The, 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 the elderly people, especially your mother-in-law, every day they go down to buy fresh produce. And sometimes they do it more than once a day. And even when we were there in 2017, Lisa's aunt that's 84 years riding on a bicycle, into the town to go buy fresh produce. That's the way of life in the rural villages. They don't go to macro, they don't go stock up for a whole month, they look for fresh produce. God called them to live daily for man. And only take as much as you need for the day. And that's a principle of His Word. But we are so living with sickness and anxiety and stress and everything's going wrong because we don't know what's going to happen next week. Don't worry about next week. Worry about today. The Bible says sufficient for today. God's already there next week worrying about what's happening. In Exodus we read, and He says, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Some of them took more than they could have. Because they didn't trust God. This is about trusting God. And the next morning, it either dissolved or it had worms in it. People, if Jesus is coming back, He's shaking us. He's shaking His church. Because the money that we have in the banks, the money that we're storing up, that the markets will crash and it will be lost, could be used to extend the kingdom of God. Can we give a lot of praise of Him for that? I'm fortunate that I'm in a church where I'm looked after, but there are many churches, and I know of it, pastors don't even get a salary because people are tithing. They don't understand their responsibility to the local church. Pastors' children are suffering. Pastors' wives, they don't want to go, the children never want to go into ministry because they see what their father, is that right, Pastor Rudolf? Pastor Rudolf has been a pastor like me on the region, sir. And that's what we try to tell churches where we go. This church looks after my needs, my wife's needs, my children's needs. But there are churches where people don't understand the responsibility to look after the shepherd, the man of God. Well, I'm not going to give it because someone else is doing it. It's responsibility. Forgive us our sins. And we heard about that, what you said. If you want your sins forgiven, the reason you want it forgiven, because sin stands as a wall in the way of the living God. Yeah, but Jesus died for me. I've confessed my sin. But now you've got unforgiveness in your heart. And the Bible says that if you can't forgive someone else, how can God forgive you? So suddenly there's this Afrikaans that uses the right word, escapes me. 
a wall of division. And it feels as you're praying and you can't get through that ceiling, through that wall. Because you're living with unconfessed sin, you're living with stuff in your life. And you can't understand why things are not happening. And if you upset with me, go to the church where they'll have to fire me after this word. But you want to hear the truth, and I'll preach the truth that God really says for you. Sin separates us from God. And Jesus speaking has told us that we must acknowledge, we must confess our sin in order to remain in right relationship. Husband and wife, you know when you know you're in right relationship in the marriage? When you lie next to each other in bed and your feet are touching each other. And you know when you're sulking and not talking to each other? There's the Gulf of Mexico between you and her. And you know when it's not right yet, you try to reach out with your foot and she pulls away. And that's a common practice throughout the world of dirty marriage counseling. Everyone, it happens to every single one. Who does it happen to? And the moment you put your foot down and that person responds, ah, then you feel good again. Remain in right relationship with God. Forgive us our sins. If we walk in the light as He's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. That means that we are walking, our feet are touching sin daily. That's what Jesus said, wash our hands. He said, wash our feet. Because we're not saved by the works in our hands, but our feet come into contact with sin, in a sinful way. And daily we need our sins confessed. Daily we need to say, Lord, forgive me. I said something, and I might not have said the, right, the wrong thing. I could have just said it in the wrong way. Saying the right thing at the wrong time, or the tone of the voice. They just said, well, you know all about that. The tone of the voice. It's not what we say. It's how we say it. Then it says, as we forgive those who sin against us. Because we want to be in right relationship with God too. But we also want to be in right relationship with those who love us. With our wife. With our family. With our in-laws. Can I get an amen on that? Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. The golden principle by which you learn. Do unto others that you will have them do unto you. If you want them to forgive you, you must forgive them. That's the rule. And Ephesians says, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's why Jesus died, not in a state. He died on the cross. Because the cross speaks of a relationship with God and a restored relationship with those around you. And you cannot have a relationship like this and forget that there's no relationship going on. You must make every effort to live at peace with one another and to remain in relationship. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to, do not lead us into temptation. Well, there will always be temptation in this world. You walk into down the shop, I said the other day, I'm saying it again. My eyes are never on cars and motorbikes. It's not important to me. It's got the biggest depreciation value. On food is another thing, but not on that. But there are always going to be temptations in our lives. Clothes, food, cars, and you've got to ask yourself, what does God want? What does God want? And to every one it to be different. For some person it might be different because you can write it off against a text. So it will be a different thing. And don't come and justify yourself that you can write off that Ferrari against your text. Everyone has different. Each one must hear by God. What is God saying? It's not that God doesn't want us to dress nice. I did it in the church of, of Thyatira on, 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 on Wednesday when I ministered. We all want the nice things in life, but there are times for the sake of love that we sacrifice the things we love because of love. 
of others. We sacrifice the things of love, the things we love, because we love others. And so we have temptations in the world, materialism and goods. We have the flesh, the power, to be in a position of power, our passions, sexual immorality, watching those movies. We have a real devil, an enemy, a father of all lies that wants to steal, kill and to destroy. Those are the real temptations. These things are in the world. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to me. But God is faithful. We will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Yeah, but please look at David. No. Look at Joseph. He ran away. And 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee youthful lusts, and seek often and call upon those that seek the Lord. There are times we have to make judgment calls. Where I've been put into situations and I have to make a judgment call at the moment. Cannot be allowed now in this situation where there's a woman. Got to call some company, you have to be here. On Friday night I did it just to protect myself. Shane, come into my office please. You never put yourself in a vulnerable or place where you know because the enemy sets you up to fall. You need to be careful. And so James 1, 12 and 30 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say again when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted. When we say, do not lead us into temptation, we are not saying God is leading us. God allows things to happen in our lives and we are there. But God wants to see what comes out of you. What comes out of you in that situation? How much you, how much have you grown? God does not allow, God allows temptation because He allows us to be tested like Job was tested. But you need to hold on to Him. Allow Him to strengthen you. Deliver us from the evil one. Well, we know the evil one in John 10, 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come to give life, life in abundance. The real purpose of the enemy, He wants to take you out. He's that sniper on the roof that wants to take you out. But you've got to trust God. And the serpent turned tempted Steve and the devil's strategy remains the same. It is always through the senses. What we see. Oh, that looks nice. Oh, that's a nice car that guy guys. Oh, that guy's got a nice wife. Do not covet. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or his possessions. What you see, what you hear, what you smell. Oh. Well, we're not smelling anything today, but the Guru was also out there. You wouldn't be focusing this morning on me. What you feel, touch. You touch something that feels nice, but it doesn't feel nice. And Hebrews 5 verse 14 says that solid food belongs to those who are full age. How do we know when people are mature? When the things of this world that die to them. When they die to the things in this world, they're not concerned about what things look like. They're not concerned about this nice this and this nice that. They're concerned about Christ. He says, when those of full age, those who by what? Reason of use have their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. When you see something, you'll know that's not good for you. All things are lawful, all things are permissible, but not all things are good. You know that watching this, what you're seeing, it's going to lead you down the wrong path. And you've got to pull yourself out of it. You know that this drink, if I have one, and I have daughters delivered me from alcohol, if I have another one, you see, nothing says that you cannot, because God has set you free, but you know where it's going to lead you. Taste not. Some things taste nice and over a few years you see the results of what tastes nice. Listen to music. What does music do? What does it do? It brings up old emotions, old girlfriends. You get yourself caught on Facebook and you start looking up old girlfriends and then you start thinking about them more than you think of your wife. 
Is that dangerous, this world is, that we find ourselves in? And so we need to overcome. When we say, Lord, do not leave, we will always be in situations which we must endure. Those that endure to the end will be saved. But we also need to overcome. And how do we overcome? The Bible says, therefore submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And as I close off, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. God answers our prayers not based upon what we've done and who we are. He answers our prayer because of His name. God's name, a name is everything. Today a name means nothing. But generations ago your name was everything. And that's why a person's name had to be honored. Your name speaks about your character, your credibility, and it emphasizes, God's name emphasizes His kingdom, His power, and His glory. Psalm 23 says, He leads me to worship Him in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 106.8 says, He saved them for His name's sake. Everything that's about who He is. When you say God's different names, His name speaks of healing, deliverance, provision. His name is everything. And you ask in prayer, you come to sit on this chair and you say, Lord, I've asked last week if you've never answered, but you need to ask and have an expectancy because God is never too early. He's never too early because He'll never set you up for failure. He'll never give you a 10-year-old motorbike that He knows you can't drive and even have an accident. God will never give you something where He has not yet prepared you for something. He's never too late. He's never too late because He's the author of time. He created time. He brought time into existence. And in the fullness of time, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. He's always on time. And you sit in that ear and you're praying and you're asking God for things. And you need to trust Him for the right time. And all He's saying in this time is, when you pray come with me, just for something to me. Surrender something to me. Honor me. Respect who I am. Be responsible. Live righteously. Trust me. Stay in right relationship with me. Be reconciled. Right relationship. Relationship with others. Endure. Overcome. And the most important thing at the end, keep your perspective on what it's all about. For thine is the kingdom, the power. That's the perspective. It's not your kingdom. It's not your ministry. It's not what the, you are nothing because you have died to Christ. Have you placed your life on the altar? Say, Lord, I have died to Son. It's all about Him. Our Father, who art in Him. When you start looking at it in that perspective, and you close on and you say, For thine is the kingdom. It's your kingdom, Lord. A kingdom that Daniel sees. All the other kingdoms on which you are, we but a stone and break. And His kingdom remains forever and ever. Psalm 138, just two last verses, says, I will worship you toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. As, as important as God's name is, His word is more important. Let all man be found lies and let God be found truthful. He will never lie. What he has said, what he has promised, he will fulfill. You need to hold on. You need to trust. You need to look forward every morning when you go to sit on the chair and have your prayer time. You need to look forward and say, Lord, I'm coming this morning to know my concerns. 
thinking of Scott this morning bringing his daughter as any father is concerned. Lord, I know that I've placed it in your hands. But I am concerned as anyone would be. I just want to make sure that she's still fine. Place your angels around. Hedge her in on every side. Cover her under your precious blood. The Lord knows when you pray what you pray. He is concerned with your everything. And so your prayer time in the morning is so important. Start rushing up the house with his popcorn prayers. Take time. Pour your heart out. Take time to listen. That God has asked you. Lord, where do you want me to be? What do you want for my life? It took me a few years to come into the place where you God was calling me to ministry. In that few years to study law, I finished my studies. I started studying law, and then out of that was the worst time of my life. I never had peace. God said, I didn't call you. And then I had to stop. I had to go to the girl at the time's parents and say, I'm not studying because my parents want to give people their daughters. I said, I have to. This is not the God's call. And then I waited another two years before God led me to where he wants me. God has a way of preparing us, calling us. Have you allowed God to speak? And there were many things I had to give up in the process. But nothing, no sacrifice you made can compare to the sacrifice that Jesus paid for you. Are you willing to surrender this morning? Are you willing to come to that place? We're going to do a little altar call right now as they begin to sing, Karim, I surrender. I want to invite you this morning and say, Lord, not my will, but your will. Not my kingdom, but your kingdom come. In my life, in my family, that you will be glorified no matter what happens. Are you ready this morning? Stand with me this morning. I surrender all, Lord.